Welcome, it's our first book club discussion and what a set of books to be starting with. It's the Vogue On series, an incredible set of panellists. We've got Charlotte Sinclair, Chloe Fox, Bronwyn Cosgrave and Judith Watt. And the designers we're going to be discussing, it's Dior, McQueen, Chanel and Scaparelli. <coughs> so an incredible set of designers as well. It's a really obvious question to start with and it is actually a really tricky question to ask. But obviously it's so pivotal to this series is, is this idea of like the great designers of this century. What makes an amazing designer? Tenacity, mm -hmm. <laughs> a great idea, uh, a willingness to adapt as if it's a you know as as society changes and respond to what women want. Mm. I think it's um, I think it's originality. I think it's courage. I think it's understanding the zeitgeist and responding to that intelligently. Mm -hmm. um, but you know. I think with some of the great designers, it's about longevity after they after they have died. Mm. However, their careers end. Um, it is their you know a good reputation which which is really important, which you have with all of these designers mm. here. I was interested in a lot of the books, and this was something that because I read the Dior book first, and this was something that first came up was this idea of like real innovation, but not just innovation in terms of design, innovation in terms of like business models or PR or how they sort of ran their whole operation. Do you think that in the case of a lot of these designers, that was also what contributed? It was this idea of completely you know, revolutionising what a fashion designer could be? Definitely, I think so, especially with Dior and with McQueen as mm. well. I think this idea of the importance of publicity, of marketing, of not just creating your fashion line, but trying to create access points within that for different kinds of audiences mm. from someone who could just buy the perfume or the pair of tights to someone who is a couture client. So there mm. was different ways of marketing the brand and different, uh, it was appealing to the widest pop popular audience really mm. as well. And marketing themselves. Mm. I mean, and, and certainly with regard to McQueen, there's that development of a, of a cult around yourself. Mm. I'm interested that you say the cult of the designer as well, because I think that's something that's I was intrigued by when reading all of the books because these are designers that have had so many sort of so many things already written about them in the popular co consciousness. So whether it's a film, so you've got that with like Coco before Chanel, or whether it's it's newspaper articles surrounding McQueen, and you kind of get the sense that people think that they know a lot about these designers anyway. Did you find that a lot of what you were doing when you were like writing these books was sort of maybe proving popular myths or actually disproving popular ideas about what the designer's work was? Because someone like Chanel, I think, is mm. quite misunderstood about some aspects of her life. Possibly. I mean, I think what's interesting about these books is that it's the Vogue perspective mm. on the book. We've all written uh, for Vogue, worked at Vogue. Um, and I, I think these were kind of conceived as a Vogue biography. Mm. Um, and yes, you know, uh, I looked actually far from the Vogue archive, but I think what is fantastic about these books, and certainly what really intrigued me, was looking um, at a designer from the perspective of Vogue. So just being allowed to go through the archive and look at all of the Vogue images, just and, and being paid to do so, yeah. is a huge yes. privilege. Yeah, I agree. I think it's the, absolutely agree, uh, agree. It was uh, the Vogue perspective. Um, and of course, they, you know, the fantastic history of photographers and illustrators, mm. illustrators writer, and writers. So a lot of the material in each of the books is, is, is mediated mm. through that vision, which for me makes it more interesting. But what I found fascinating about Scaparelli is the moment she started being dangerous, i.e. radical, mm. truly interesting, doing what she was famous for, which she's did many more actually, I think, interesting things before. Mm. But the surrealism angle is when Vogue dropped her. Interesting. You know, and so, yes, it dropped her because it was terribly unmiddle class. Mm. You know, it was avant-garde Paris fashion, working with designers, and kind of challenging ideas of fashion or what clothes should actually look like um, and be about. And uh, Vogue stopped really, they never featured. So when you're dealing with you know, mm. material, is it in vogue or isn't it? You know, how, how do you get around that? The tear dress isn't, there, isn't in there. Um, the, uh, the skeleton dress isn't in there. 
the shoe hat isn't in there. There are numerous things that she's famous and respect was, was famous and is famous for that, that aren't in there. So when you're actually writing a book and researching a book, mm. this was interesting because there were certain parameters that you were confined by, don't you think? Mm. Well, actually, when I say that mm. too, I mean, when I was features editor at Vogue, Alex Shulman, the editor, really encouraged me to write in a very particular way, which was, okay, tell me something I don't know. <laughs> and yeah. it kind of reminded me about uh, a costume designer who works with Madonna, says when you go into a meeting with her, she already knows everything. Madonna always knows everything, and you have to surprise her, and she's going to know the surprise too. Mm -hmm. So it's actually not just on the pages of Vogue, but thinking, what would a Vogue reader want to know? And it is an incredibly sophisticated audience, mm -hmm. um, but just filling in the gaps and going a bit further than I would say the rest. Mm -hmm. One thing I was interested by is it's very much in relation to what you all mentioned about using the Vogue archives, is you all did address throughout the books the way in which magazines or editors could shape a, a designer's career and they could influence what was popular and what wasn't. Do you think that that's something that was integral to the success of all these designers, whether it was Carmel Snow really championing the look or, uh, or Vogue saying that this was like she was the best designer, as, as they did in the case of Scaparelli or Chanel at points? Do you think that's sort of what pushed these designers to the front? Was that? That championship, or, or the lack well, of certainly, championship. Well, I mean, it was obviously, uh, completely obviously part of the success, mm. you know. Um, but I think that, you know, certainly with Chanel and Scaparelli, you have to look beyond that, and Dior as well. Mm. Um, it, you know, they weren't just oper operating on the level of haute couture, or, or the top levels. They were actually, you know, licensing their names, doing licenses mm. in the States, certainly mm. with Scaparelli. Mm. So while people might think, oh, God, it is so elitist, which of course Vogue was, mm. um, it, it was, they're more interesting, I, I really think they're more interesting than that. And so Vogue obviously endorsing uh, and finding her interesting and being fantastically supportive and of Chanel as well mm. uh, was, was crucial. But actually she, she did it herself. Mm. Sorry, you know, it wasn't just Vogue, mm. there were other yeah. people, you know, and, 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 and <clears throat> but what she liked, and I'm not sure it's the same with Chanel, she loved the milieu of artists mm. who, were, who were employed by Vogue and photographers and that bohemian milieu. And I think it's important to recognise that about the period, certainly the mm. 20s and 30s. Yeah, I, I definitely think the editors, my actual perspective in, in analysing articles, particularly you know in the 1920s and 30s, that they were almost in awe of Chanel. They sort of were marvelled at the way that she could create such revolutionary clothing, clothing that completely changed fashion and, mm -hmm. and affected the way I dress, but you know, just making sporty clothes or you know, uh, making a sweater fashionable, just really easy things. When women were walking around in corsets and really long skirts, slashing hemlines. Mm -hmm. So I definitely picked up this tone of wonderment, actually, mm -hmm. you know. But do you know, I mean, I'm sure you saw this, uh, at Bronwyn. The there is fantastic information mm. in uh, in journalism that you don't get from history books at oh, all. No, and absolutely. this one fantastic thing that I found, I'm about to praise it. It was was um, the mention that the little black dress was in fact sold far better in purple. Right. Oh, really? yeah. 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 And you know, yeah, and, myths, that, and, myths. Yeah, the, and so, be, but because Vogue photo did the black one. And reproduced that. Mm. That was the one yeah. that that was most appropriate and took off. But the purple mm. sold far more. Mm. Mm. And things like that are really interesting. I also think that this was a, you know, I think Dior said it was the golden age of publicity. This mm. was a moment when mm. magazines came into their own. They were really, really important advertising. You have. 40s and 50s, post -world, world War period, when just things went crazy. Yeah. It was the Mad mm. Men era, isn't it? So publicity was incredibly important, and certainly with Christian Dior, he used to write these incredibly tightly edited mm. show notes, yeah. that he, so he could mm. control the message, so that, mm. that he mm. could control exactly what um, was written in the magazines. And actually, I think one of Bettina Ballard said there was very little journalism involved in reporting on a Dior mm. show because you could just literally just parrot fashion write out these show notes mm. and he would deliver what the message was. And that's almost kind of, well it definitely is kind of sparking off what we know and kind of expect today and I think a lot yeah. of people criticise that 
today. I did want to ask about this interwar period and in the, in the period you mentioned where you get that boom of, of journalism, where you get this huge popularisation of magazines and that accessibility of sort of print. And did you all notice that? Well, obviously the one with McQueen you wouldn't, but that sense of kind of information being so much more readily available. Yeah, and I think the photographers working at that time were really exciting as well. You had Robert Kappa, you had all these amazing war photographers who suddenly turned into fashion photographers, mm. Irving Penn as well, you had Inga Morris, you had Lee Miller, you had this incredible, just amazing um, golden age of photography. So everything was changing, everything was becoming more open, more exciting. Um, and I think, yeah, it was, a, it was a moment that they all capitalized on, mm. certainly. I, I, I think there was, uh, the word for me is access, and it was sort of the first time that, say, designers were looked at as tastemakers. Mm -hmm. So Vogue, and Vogue really had the access all areas pass. They could go anywhere. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what happens when you do work at Vogue. Mm -hmm. um, people generally tend to want to be in the magazine, and, and we had the privilege of looking at these early Mavericks, and then later on McQueen, but you really, is the, I think the pages do reflect some of that, like inside Chanel's home on the mm. Riviera. I mean, that mm. wasn't really done before. Magazines mm. were the first to do that mm. kind of thing in a really beautiful way. Um, Did you find the way they were championing the designers at the time, was that similar to how they were championing designers like McQueen in a more... Do you know what? They didn't changed. advertise. They weren't basically, they weren't advertising. Yeah. So yeah. it's, a good it's point. completely different from now. Yeah. So let's not get carried away thinking it's the same because it wasn't. Mm. The, the couturiers didn't advertise. They were reliant mm. on the women who wore their clothes yeah. being photographed. That's how it worked. Vogue didn't have revenue from the fashion houses. They had it from the manufacturers and small dressmakers, etc., and cars. They didn't have it from the designers. So for a designer to be able to work out how they would get publicity. It was dependent on the women that they dressed. And in the case of Chanel and Scaparelli themselves. And Dior. Mm. And Dior. Yeah, but no, but Dior's a man. Dior's a man. I don't mean, but he, he did go inside his house. You know, oh, the house, okay, sorry. Like, then, yes. He yeah. was really a celebrity. Dior yeah. was the, you know, he was the most famous, one of the most famous yeah. men mm -hmm. in the world at that period, at that particular time. I think they did some kind of... Sorry, can I just go it? back to this? Because <laughs> this, this, is, this is really, this is about how it worked yeah. in the interwar period. Scaparelli and Chanel were important because they were women and they wore their own clothes. Yeah. And that idea, for the first time really, of self-promotion, because the other designers like Madeleine Viennet and Jean, Long, uh, Jean Lombard were incredibly shy yeah. and retiring. And them. both of them were great self-publicists. They mm. had to be. Mm. They had to be. They had to push themselves out there whether they liked it or not. They had to be their image. But the other thing which is very different after the war, certainly with McQueen and with Dior, is that the nature of the clients changed. And during the interwar period, up to the Second World War in 1939, those clients were mostly over 30. Mm. It wasn't about dressing young women, mm. nubile, debutantes. Mm. It was women of style, and all of them were old enough to have had their children, got that out of the way, and been independent. At what I mean, period? So, uh, the interwar period, certainly right. with Daisy Fellows and all of oh, those okay. women. Mm. You know, the, the, and they were projecting, certainly with Chanel and Scaparelli, a house style that I think that they were taking from the designers, or inspired mm. by the designers. But those women, that, that changed after mm. the war, mm. certainly. And what changed it? Because they'd all got old, and some of them been arrested for collaborating and lost right. money. Right. You know, basically, yeah. and, and Melissa Rogers youth died. Youth you know, and you know, after the war, Daisy Fellows, who was the kind of great clothes horse, became a little old lady, according to Nancy Mitt. It was it, it was age. You know, yeah. that was it, and it was for the younger gener. It was for the younger generation, and I think Dior catered to that brilliant, yeah. absolutely brilliant. Mm. I think he, he. I think he caught the tail end of yeah. the grand arms. The yes. Lipids. The, the, the Susan well, Patton, the yes, but um, the ball what he, culture. But, but his, but Harley his clothes, yeah, but yeah. his clothes fed a fantasy yeah. that the younger generation yeah. would, because people are nostalgic about mm. style a lot of time. I think it was brilliant. But McQueen, yeah. equally, I mean, maybe it's something that all designers need to do. Had certain muses, had had a had a type mm. of woman who wore his clothes and wore his clothes well and expressed what he couldn't physically express himself with his mm, own certainly. clothes. 
Yes. Daphne Guinness and yeah, Isabella Blow and, and Annabelle Nielsen particularly. Because at the end of your mm. book, you do make that comparison between Schiaparelli and, and McQueen, and I thought that was an interesting mm. one to make because as much as McQueen is kind of very much a modern designer, some of the I, d I found so many comparisons when I was yes. reading through, not just in kind of the way he designed, which obviously you can see comparisons to Schiaparelli, but also in this idea of the type of women who embodied his clothes. They weren't, you know, young. Well, the real connection, yes, absolutely, the real connection, uh, there was very strong women, exactly. strong, if exactly. overused word, hideous expression, but that's what it was, <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, uh, Schiaparelli was famous for, the, you know, her hard chic, you know, these mm. tough women, tough looking women who were distinctive, but dressed in a certain kind of very empowered way, mm. in a very daring way, and the Queen also had that, but of course both of them uh, had connections with Anderson and Shepherd. Schiaparelli had her um, tailoring blocks made at Anderson Shepherd in Savile Row, and that was a, that was a really interesting link. And mm. of course, mm. you know, there's a you know DNA which runs through Givenchy and then through to McQueen. Mm. The Givenchy worked for Schiaparelli, but I mm. think it was very much in the shows and this idea of collaborations, Chloe, as yes. well. Mm. Yes. You know, and being very very open to it, and you don't see that any at the moment. We're not seeing it, that the fashion presentations tend to be quite um, formal. Whereas mm. with McQueen, it would, they were theatrical. It was the same with Schiaparelli they were as well. Artists. Yeah, absolutely. And not working scared of working with artists, yeah. not scared of it, loving it. Because they were that talented themselves yes. that it was unthreatening. Yes, mm. I agree. Mm. In a way, I think you can see a divide then between the work that. Dior and Chanel did, because there's a great quote in, in your book, Bronwyn, where you say, where Chanel says, it's a very famous quote, but she says that fashion isn't an art, it's a craft, I think it's something similar to that. And do you think that there is a kind of a divide between those who are making clothes about about day-to-day -day life and about what women wanted to wear and, and those like Scaparelli and McQueen, who there was a higher... Well, well I think Scaparelli knew how to do both, actually, mm. but mm. I do think, yes, I think there mm. is. I'm um, just standing up for Chanel. She also did fantastic evening dresses that mm. were unbelievably luxurious. Yeah, and I think beautiful. she enjoyed Not the, pra the pragmatism of what she did as well. I didn't think that you, I found that really. She interesting. did do yeah. interesting evening wear and something I in the in the late thirties and some a connection just from examining Vogue. I mean, I always loved dis the Vogue archive, which I used ceaselessly <laughs> um, when I worked there. Um, has always led me to great discoveries, uh, but it, there was an interesting time in Chanel's career at the late 30s, just before she closed her house, where she was doing these very opulent mm. gowns, which were strikingly different, but she was spending all this time in the Riviera, actually, oh, and not a lot of time in her house, and she was going to casinos, and you know, her boyfriend was the Duke of Westminster, mm. and I really think that environment mm. created mm. that oh, aspect. Yes. Uber and it's never really been <laughs> discovered or, or, or analyzed actually, because her personal life is mm. so interesting. And a challenge for me mm. actually was separating the personal from the design. And these books really did want to focus on clothes, but it's very mm. diff difficult with someone like Chanel, possibly with Scaparelli, I don't know enough about her, but to separate the person from the clothing, and yeah. I, I was kept being told, keep it on the clothing. Oh, but you can't. Yeah. <laughs> you can't. Yeah. You know, sorry, the there was the Schiaparelli as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, they, these difficult. women were absolutely fascinating. Mm. And yeah. they designed yeah. the really clothes they wanted to wear mm. from their own experiences. Mm. That was one of the central questions I wanted to ask, and especially as well with McQueen, was this idea of whether you, you can sort of, because you are obviously using the Vogue archive, and you want to look at the clothes, because I think in a way, mm. it's so easy to overshadow it with kind of, gossip and what was going on in their personal life, but did, did you find that as well with McQueen? This yeah, funnily enough, I was asked the opposite thing to what Bronwyn was being asked. I was being <laughs> yeah. asked for more more of the man, because it, it it's so recent, the terrible thing that happened to him, that that's mm. almost overpowering um, in people's minds, I think, his achievement as a designer. It's very hard to see that achievement now. And it's very hard to separate the clothes from the man whose life was informing the clothes. So, for example, the, the clothes became darker and the mm. message became more um, nihilistic, I suppose, certainly his last collection, um, which was an incredible visionary collection, was also 
about the end of the world as we know it. So mm. people are, are reading a lot, I think, mm. into his clothes but is that in light of what was going on in his passion? mind. Do you, think that, do you think that is something that should happen? Is that important? Should we understand the designers as people? And, and can you understand a collection without understanding? Well, that's how you yeah. sell clothes, is yeah. this myth. And I don't know if you actually even know the person, because things certainly, if you read articles about McQueen before um, his sad ending, were very bouncy and buoyant, yeah. <laughs> lo and behold. Um, and there is this, and what Judith said earlier about you know the legacy of a designer and how it is so mm. controlled, mm. and it, it does mm. have to do with advertising, yes. really, because yeah. and you have to perpetuate this myth, and it mm. is something when one writes about fashion, it does become deeply frustrating because yeah. it keeps yes. this sort of machine alive where yeah. what is truth and what is fiction mm -hmm. and I actually am more interested in the real person mm -hmm. and you know mm -hmm. what led them to create something but it has it is about its commerce and it mm -hmm. has to be a very uh, bland selling point that sells that's, that's why I, I quite enjoyed going I mean I really enjoyed going into the archive and looking at what was written and I'm sure the experience was the same for you guys as well written when they debuted their their first collections mm -hmm. and their first exposure to Vogue because at that point it's being written about as a totally new experience it's totally they don't know they don't know these designers mm -hmm. so they're that's a, probably the most faithful mm -hmm. report well, well, well certainly yeah. the new look show is yeah. a spectacular show probably yeah. one of the most spectacular fashion shows ever yeah mm -hmm. and, 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 and the excitement yeah. I'm sure was just I had an interesting conversation with a, a guy called Richard Benson who was editing oh. The Face mm. um, as McQueen was bursting out and he was saying that uh, that contrary to, to what what looking back is telling us that at the time people were incredibly anti him. Yeah. Yes, they were walking um, they, out. Yeah. They, were absolutely, they, they disliked him and he went absolutely, he was brilliant. He was radical. He mm -hmm. was radical, but that is another similarity with Scaparelli. Yeah, and this is, not, this is not about mm, Scaparelli, but it's actually really no, interesting. Both of them looked at where fashion was. They were both clever enough and thought, mm -hmm. I'm going to do the opposite. The time is right to do something different. And McQueen with his tailoring, absolutely. Very oh, well, I know McQueen McQueen was. Yeah. Absolutely, I'm going to tailor yeah. it's all flowing, so he's going to get rid of that. No, sorry, we're going to do something different. And yeah. he did. And Scaparelli did exactly the same thing mm. in 1927. Um, and I was researching, look, looking at this, and I think that she, uh, she was influenced by Max Ernst's artworks collection, which called Frottage, which were not sexual, but in fact, <laughs> were, you know, it's not a euphemism. It was, uh, it was from rubbing floorboards and this fantastic um, three-dimensional texture, grey mm. and black and white, that he got. And, of course, she was a friend of his, and I think that influenced her first collection with the knitting, mm. with the wonderful bow-knot sweater, which you can't see in here because, of course... Douglas Pollard, who's a wonderful illustrator, has done it in black and white, but she wore that to a, a lunch at Vogue. Trompe mm -hmm. Loy, surreal, like mm -hmm. wore it to a lunch at Vogue. All the Max Ernst references, you know, current avant-garde mm -hmm. walked in and immediately success. And it really was success because it was the impact. And I think with, with it, for a lot of designers, it is about impact and it's getting... Yeah. And it's getting the time, the, the timing, timing. And, and, right. and also yeah. borrowing so much. I mean, they all mm. lift. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. I um, love the web of cross references between how you'd yeah. all compare the work that yeah. you told and the rivalries, but also the yeah, the borrowing, as you yes. said. Absolutely. Being able yeah, to pick up something, get someone to help you yeah. make it, mm. launch it, have the confidence, mm. yeah. you know. I want to return a little bit to this idea we said when you were talking about how Vogue didn't always champion Scaparelli because I wanted to, was there a point that you could see where Vogue started to kind of become complementary and supportive of McQueen? Well, I think it was tied in with the employees in his case. There was Plum Sykes and there was Isabella Blow, mm. both of whom championed him quite from very early stages. But there was this wide criticism that we have, especially like allegations of misogyny, etc., cetera, et cetera, which mm. I know were sort of... Never so Quite much in Vogue, actually, although I would argue that Vogue didn't necessarily... Um, sometimes I had a frustrating experience because some of the best illustrations of his brilliance, um, the photographs are beautiful, but sometimes it's, it, 
it was hard to see in some of the shoots because the shoots became bigger things. Don't in, you think it in was the modern the day? They became more than just about the clothes. They were stories. That shoot at Hills um, with Izzy Blow and McQueen. That to that me was, was really. I mean, I knew about him from the beginning, but that really, I think, he went. Yeah. For better lack of better of word, mainstream. Like that really was his calling mm. card. That vote yeah. shoot. That, that's and quite what a, a gift for him. To yeah. have you that. talking about the first student collection? Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, but there was that great shot of Izzy and Detmar Blow. It's in the book. Yeah, it's, it's yes, one of the first. Yes. That really yeah. is. It it's from the graduate. Student. For the general public, I mean, that's really when he became a name. Mm. I think it was from I don't his think graduate so. show. I don't think at all. I think it was. I think you know. God bless Isabella Blow for doing that. But I think it took him. Another two years to Possibly, get any attention yeah. that because was, right but when, it, when that was pub, when that was published, that was when he was panned for his taxi driver collection yeah. and described you know described as creating a theatre of cruelty. So, mm. but you've you know, got some great quotes about that mm, in the book as yes. well about that kind of that shock and people saying it was half naked models and it was a horror show and. I think it's easy to forget that he wasn't always like the fashion industry's yeah. darling. That too. Yeah. That one. <laughs> that, was well. that was Vanity, that was Vanity Fair, Vanity right? Fair, yeah, yeah, that was a huge you, moment. Can we just show the camera? Yeah, that, yeah, that was. Sure that that was. Mm, he was. That's such an iconic image. peak. Yeah. But that's yeah. quite a different setup to what we were talking about before with designers such as Dior, where their first offerings were picked up on much more quickly. And I think there's mm. a sense of kind of having to have your. Those, those days showing off schedule and, and doing that kind of daily grind before you're in vogue now. It's then such a different world though. Exactly. I mean, it's certainly a different in, world. Yeah, in Paris and couture, and it's, uh, you know, the couture industry had been vastly depleted by the war and mm. lots of designers had gone to New York or just li simply closed shop. And then obviously it was a sort of reactionary show because it was incredibly decadent with these incredible uh, sk skirts and busted um, uh, corsets and mm. all these kind of amazingly Dark, intricate right. yeah, 40, mm. the skirt lengths back down to the floor and yards and yards and yards of material so that that makes <coughs> sense within the context of this mm. incredible this moment of austerity and and post-war mm. Paris um, so I mean back, it, you know if you did it today but you know well, yeah. but Dior had been doing for years. <laughs> Dior had been working for years mm. behind the scenes yeah, he'd, he, he'd yeah. been working for years, for like Belma, yes, yeah. um, and mm. uh, he got the, he was clever enough, poor little thing because he was so shy and nervous, <laughs> wasn't he, oh. to get the backing of Boussac, yeah. he had money behind him. Six million, he, Yeah, maybe? it was just yeah. phenomenal the way that machine yeah. works, and that's really post-war, isn't yeah. it, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. that feeling yeah. of, you know, all well, that Chanel, got to be in a row I, for that. I think Chanel did the exact same thing, but just with her lovers, so she would, you know, boy cable. And then the Duke of Westminster, mm. I mean, the Duke of Westminster setting up an atelier for him, mm. for her, mm. at his estate. I mean, mm. she, it was the same, I really think, she never married any of them, but they were always bankrolling her, her business. It's very him interesting, giving her, isn't it? her house in London, her shop in yeah. London was one of his houses. So can a designer not reach their creative potential, do we think, and, until they have financial backing? Is it impossible? Yeah, yeah. Yes. No, I completely disagree. <laughs> I, I think some of the greatest creativity comes from not having any money. From struggling yeah. but to get and, it out and there. Finding, yeah. But you know, Takes poor old Dior, <laughs> we know what happened to him. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. Heart attack, tranquilizers, drinking, yeah. too much chocolate, the strain <laughs> of it. No, it was. but what was that about? Him. No, but that was about trying to innovate all the time. Yes, all, every it was season, terrible. But it was so interesting season. about yeah. Dior setting every six months. It has to be new, new. and it has to cater to the press. Mm. Yeah. It has yeah. to, and that, that was, was his. Yeah. Although so even that, there's sort of you know there's there's a fiction there as well because although, of course, it was it named a new line and there was a new direction. Mm. There was a lot given over to that, but probably that look that dominant silhouette was only would only make up about 15 percent of mm. the entire collection so he was quite canny in that he would like designers today they have their what he called a trafalgar his his mm. big showy yeah. moment um and then the rest of it would be very um wearable sort of mm. wearable and every day and 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 kind mm. yes please do you remember those pieces um, of course not. No. <laughs> yeah. Sadly, yeah. actually, yeah. That's, that's sadly, very yeah. telling yeah. that you say it was like designers today because I think that's what I think that's what really comes across in in your book is this 
is that idea of how much he did sort of pioneer mm. fashion as we know it today. And I think it's very easy to presume that always existed. But with the mm. new look, it was as much about the business side of that as mm. it was about the actual silhouette. Mm. And do you think do, do you think that was a turning point for? For it's Dior. hard to know, mm. you know. Of course, it, it, definitely the way that he set up his business and his commercial enterprises, I think, were quite unique. I mean, I'm sure. Th- I mean, what do you think, Julie? I, I, yeah. Well, the Scaparelli, you know, and Chanel, both equally yeah. business minded. Yeah, but actually, I, weren't they in terms of licensing? Yeah, yeah. but, but, but yeah. Dior's collection yeah. Yeah, forced good. Chanel out of retirement. The new yeah. look. She was so mm. with him horrified. He, he did yeah. everything. Yeah. You've got some handbags, red carpet dressing, yeah. so many things that Fights, current fashion runs on was yeah. created by him. He almost kind of had it all organized. It was I like mean, a, yeah, it was a blueprint for the, for the way that, that fashion has. But in the book, like. he talk about how he wanted someone to be able to go into his, one of his shops and leave with something and everything. Yeah, he's a little something. Yeah, Mark Jacobs. Yeah, yeah that's so yeah. exactly. If you, and there was a, a ready to you know you could buy a, a ready to wear suit. You could buy a pair of shoes. You could buy. A tie or a perfume or something small but lovely. You so know, it's and, and the branding. Yeah, <laughs> the way that we shop now, you might not be able to buy your Chanel suit, but you could buy the perfume, or you might not be able to buy whatever mm. Marc Jacobs jacket, but you could buy the sunglasses. So it is a very modern way mm-hmm. of of being a designer, I think. And he's and he always knew that that was a very important aspect, and he always embraced that because someone like Balenciaga never did interviews yeah. and absolutely was horrified by the whole idea of fashion as a business, I think. Mm. And the celebrity aspect, you know, yeah. Marlene Dietrich, her legs sold his pantyhose. Mm. She yeah. was the spokesperson for yeah. his tights. Mm. I mean, he really went in on that as well. Yeah, mm. the movie industry. It's interesting, yeah. the celebrity question, because you have to go with it, don't you? I mean, McQueen I mean, certainly was, right. was openly furious about all of it. Yes. He banned posh spies yeah. from his, yeah. his show, um, the Amy Mullins, that girl with no legs opened. Sure. Um, because he didn't want to detract from her and then he's got this awkward situation where Kate Blanchett's in vogue wearing one of his dresses and it never sat comfortably Mm. with him. He never really And it's actually sitting more comfortably since he died, ironically. I mean when 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 Kate Middleton stood up wearing his one of his names designs, it was the ultimate irony really Mm. was everything he would have loathed. Yes, it wasn't right to the end. And it wasn't by (laughs) him. Yeah. By the end, he had withdrawn completely. He wasn't playing the game at all. He didn't show up to Vogue fashion shoots he Mm. should have shown up to. He was openly being rude about celebrities. I don't think it helped him at all. Mm. But this raises quite an interesting question about, and this is something that's kind of for Judith, which is the sense of when you're writing about houses that still exist. And because obviously, as you mentioned, Bronwyn, at the start, Chanel's image is in a way tailored in all of our minds by what mm. Chanel as a house mm. continues to sort mm. of push about her and we do have that with Dior because mm. there's still these popular ideas about what Dior is and, and especially mm. with McQueen as well but do you find that was somewhat liberating in a way because with separately because you don't have this fabulous <laughs> fabulous to have the freedom and also not much has been written about her and to find that's this true. wealth but do you think that's because her, the house nice. doesn't still exist yes. that's the reason people haven't written about it Oh, I think she was overshadowed by Chanel's fantastic marketing machine, but you go talk to designers, great designers, they all know exactly who she was. She's a designer's designer, like the Queen was. Mm. She was a designer's designer. Mm. I know exactly who she was. Gabrielle was. Every great fashion person knows who she was. So she's she's a kind of sleeping lion. Mm. And of course, she now has, you know, the, the, the name has been bought and is going to be relaunched um, next year uh, by Diego de la Valle. And they've got, they've got her old... Um, building back at um, in uh, uh, 21 Place Vendôme. I mean, it's going to be very, very interesting and a very difficult act yeah. to follow, but utterly liberating mm. to be able mm. to say actually what you think and not have somebody who is poised to sue. I mean, she was certainly, she was certainly bipolar, no mm. doubt about that at all. I mean, reading her, you know, that's the other thing. If, if you have an autobiography to, or anything yeah. like that to re- refer back to, it's you know, yeah. Dior, Dior, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. To be able to to be able to do that, and she was, you know, I was reading this. So I thought this woman's absolutely bipolar. There's absolutely no doubt about it at all. Mm. You know, creative highs and lows mm. of terrible despair, just like the Queen and mm. Chanel. Yeah, you know, mm. ooh, like this all the time. You know, and mm. that was really interesting. And that's the kind of thing 
that nobody's ever going to talk about in a magazine. Mm. You know, the, yes. de the depression of Elsa Schiaparelli, well, it's just not going to be interesting, <laughs> is it? But, you know, the relaunch of her, it's all fabulous, is. Mm -hmm. And so that, writing books is very different from writing for magazines because you are, to a certain extent, and these are small books, allowed to explore things. And mm -hmm. that really is uh, it's yeah. a lovely thing to be able to do. That's yeah. interesting that you kind of raise that, the art of writing about mm -hmm. fashion, because do you find when you write for a magazine there is this just this natural sense to condense and focus on the new was did you all find it quite liberating to be able to you know get your teeth into something and be a bit more candid and a bit more a bit more honest than you would be able to in, in a feature about a designer um i don't think i was yeah. any more candid no. than i would have been for vogue like, you know i think well, yeah you can be candid and honest and hopefully both in, mm. in the magazine so i don't necessarily think that i think just the joy for me was just having this, this material. The meat. Mm. Yeah, this primary source of just the most extraordinary material that you could the draw images. on. Yeah, mm. The images, the reports, everything just felt like it, it, well, it was happening then. So there was a sense of urgency mm. and excitement about it. So, mm. And I think, that uh, honestly, translates. about the images, I mean, I've done many books and you always struggle with your publisher to spend money on images and it's always that Vogue image you want, you know, shot mm. by one of those great photographers and you have to cut back on something so you can mm. get that image in Vogue and this was just the opportunity, you had every image and yeah. you could pick the ones you wanted. Mm. So that's an incredibly attractive proposition. Mm. I think, but I, th I, going back to Vogue, I think what makes it so interesting as well is the, is the crossover between artists and illustrators photographers and designers and graphic designers and that m meshing yeah, together the, the integration is, is it makes it visually really interesting mm. um, but you know you I know you want to talk about it you know the business idea I mean Chanel who loathed Scaparelli and vice versa yeah. I didn't write uh, so much about that no though. it was absolutely spent uh, well quite a while talking about how ridiculous basically she was to do press releases and mimic them, and then of course went off completely madly in the allure of Chanel about poor Christian Berard being, you know, at the helm of gossip against her. You know, mm. absolutely insane nonsense. But what's interesting about that is I don't need to do a press release. I don't need to give these dresses names. They've got numbers. What's your problem? Mm. And there's, you know, <laughs> thing, and it's very interesting. And that is when the personality mm -hmm. of, of, and I think there was more freedom then for designers to have personalities. So well, they could you know, express their real yeah. personality, yes. I think, mm. and be more open. I mean, I mm. just even know from covering the shows in the early 90s mm. to now, you could just walk backstage and get a moment. I mean, a long moment. You could just spend the whole show. And now everything is so much more sanitized. Mm. And I don't know. I mean, certainly Dior, he talked about the two Dior's, his, his yeah. front-facing, publicity-facing yeah. Dior of Maison de Dior and the real Dior, who was mm. this shy, retiring person who spent a lot of time just sketching yeah, his bathtub. Maybe he book. was bipolar <laughs> as well. Yeah. But I think <laughs> maybe modern, those are personalities, to all of them. In modern personalities in fashion are, you see the two, mm. definitely. Mm. The person for show. And the, the person, person the private person. That has to yeah. create, and yeah. that is, you know, I think the word designer is incredibly restricted mm. when you think about the people we got the chance, they're all mavericks, really, in their own way. But, you know, it's almost like tastemaker really is the mm. word. I mean, if there's a better word, because yeah. it's not just about designing clothes. And frankly, half of them, I mean, now, today, they don't even design the clothes no. anymore. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm interested that you Absolutely. say tastemaker, because that's one yes. thing that struck me was this idea of like, just revolutionizing what taste was. So whether it was the new look or whether it was Chanel with her jersey or whether it was even something like Scaparelli pioneering this idea of a show and having a great fashion show. Do you think it's possible for designers working today to have those kind of pure, like incredible, revolutionary moments in fashion where w the, our ideas of what you should be wearing just kind of completely change? Like you had with the new look where people, mm. half of women's clothing. I think away. so, the if they bother, the bumpster, the if, they, if they're good enough to think of it and do it, yeah. Yeah. yes, of McQueen. course it just, yeah, and McQueen, absolutely. Yes, if they're good enough, yeah. yes it is. Picking that thing in the air. Yes, you know, but they have to think of it first, poor things, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just, it, you know, some people can't do it, you know. I think, great I think ones probably can. There's, there's more pressures, there's more at stake, certainly if you have 
a large company behind mm. you like LVMH or mm. the Gucci Group or something like that where you are expected to deliver a certain amount of money every year. So I imagine there is more pressure, but I don't think that a designer like Prada would not do something that she believed in just because mm. you know, she has, well, she she has a she certain... Yeah, well, she owns it. She owns it. But, but you know, she's on the stock market, so there are, but, there are, yeah, yeah, no, no, there are right. contingencies. Right. Yeah. But I, d I do think it is interesting when you think, like, you know, who are the designers mm. that actually innovate? And I think today, just looking at clothes, they're more like these designers, say Nicholas Gasquet, Balenciaga, mm. he'll create a collection, and then you just see it in New York the next season by, like, seven different designers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And there are those designers yeah. that yeah. do. And I think back in the day, like, Dior kind of owned the new look. No yeah. one really did it after him, other than, say, a manufacturer. Yeah. But maybe there was more, I don't know if that made it more pressurized to do something new, whereas mm -hmm. today, these designers, it's like, you look to Paris, you look to London, you look to London, Paris, maybe, I would say, these designers that can really create things, and then it just trickles down to the rest of mm -hmm. everywhere else. <laughs> they kind of yeah. feed off those. I think there'll always be designers who are true originals, who have the great ideas, who yeah. can disseminate this totally new understanding of what we should wear and how we should wear it. And mm. I think that's that's just you know the way people work. It's just artistry, isn't it? So I think those will always exist. Did you know, Phil, with, with McQueen, I don't know about all of you, that it was ever a conscious act. I feel that it was something... He was something other, something, something kind of. Well, he said it himself that it, it that it, it, it's a gene. Yeah. That it's not Damn. something you can learn. Mm -hmm. It's something you're born with. Mm -hmm. But he and he, it's a, a gift, and it just comes out of you. But mm -hmm. he did learn. He did learn. Yeah. He did. But, learn. but also his his timing in the mid '90s, it, there was a lot of money sloshing around, and certainly when he got to those great couture houses, he could do what he liked. Yeah. And. Even if it didn't sell, mm. he could still but keep he kind going. Of, yes, I agree. And he loved. I mean, he he loved the fact that he had the ateliers to work with. Oh, that was amazing, yeah. wasn't it? That was that a was revolutionary moment. And that was he loved him a lot. Yeah, uh, but you know, he really appreciated. He really appreciated that, and that was very important. But it was. I think it's quite evident he couldn't do what he liked for these people. Yeah. He actually, in the end, in the he end. couldn't. In the end. Because it boiled down to, yeah, in the end, he couldn't. And he really tried at Givenchy, God mm. bless him. Mm. You know, he really, really tried and did some wonderful stuff. But, you know, it was, it was again, the, 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 the market was against him and, and he obviously hated it. And he was somebody, I, I think it was like, well, probably the same Scaparelli, you know, it's like, God, you know, this is too stressful. I can't think, I can't cope, I can't mm. draw, I can't, you know. Mm. It, this is just overwhelmingly too much. And I, I, I certainly think with Scaparelli, that was, that was the case. And even, know, both bipolar. Even you know? at Chanel at the mm. end, when she, well, the beginning of her, well, her, before the comeback, when she shut her house, I think she was just like, I'm over it. I can't yes. do this anymore. I'm exhausted. My, yeah. my staff is striking. You know, I'm shutting up and moving to Switzerland. Yeah. <laughs> she did move to Switzerland because of uh, because of her supposed collaboration. Well, with there's the Nazis. Right. Well, I didn't touch on that. Here. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry to tell you, but that's really interesting because yeah. well, there was that Scaparelli. and some other things oh, yeah. actually. Yeah, but Scaparelli, you know, was accused actually of collaborating, yeah. you know, and uh, as well, and that's very interesting. Mm. Do you, you know, I, I think that that's fascinating that they survived, mm. that they survived it. But do you put that into a book? Like I didn't like touch this? on the w World War Two at all because the house was shut and Vogue didn't cover mm. her. So when she came back, that was the moment. Mm. Were there any references in Vogue to like these insinuations about her connection? No, of course not. I mean, there were... Uh, it's interesting because you would expect those kind of references in Vogue. No, you wouldn't. Yeah. Absolutely not. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. No, they just wouldn't have dreamt of it. No, There's she was gone and then she was back. And yeah. she was back, you know, and, and what she did after she came back really just were subtle changes from, you know, 1954 to 1971, but she was always in there. Um, but no, they I mean, would ev never. Everyone knew, I mean, everyone knew. You read Cecil Beaton's diaries mm. and his writings, and obviously yeah, But he was, he was never a reliable source, Cecil Beaton. But he was very <laughs> good at gossip. Yeah, yeah but that's <laughs> gossip. But, but he, you know, he would mention things mm. like that, but they would never get into Vogue. Do you know what's interesting, actually, is that Vogue, 
the, the period that I was looking at never interviewed a designer. Or oh, they did once. Mm. They, they did once with it. Chanel and Lush. But they, but they may have, but not the others. And it, no, hang on, let me just Bettina say, Ballard it was the, interviewed. Yeah, but it was, the, it was the commentary on them, distinctive commentary mm. that you would get in um, about a design and that, you know, at the end of the 30s was in Harper's Bazaar, of course, with Carmel Snow. Mm. Mm. And that was a different, sorry, made a mistake there, that made, um, made for very different re- reading. Yeah. We are actually going to say something about this designer, or dressmaker as they were called, a dressmaker, what they are, what they're doing, uh, whether they're interesting, whether they're going to last, and Vogue didn't do that. It mm. would always, it was all, it would, you know, it would just abnegate responsibility. It's like, it's like with the marriage of the um, Duke of Windsor and Wallace Simpson. You know, British Vogue was not allowed to discuss it. There was no reference at all in it because it would offend the royal family. Was that quite a struggle then when you were using the Vogue archive was to kind of go through this material and have to be aware of what was actually happening in that designer's life and then look at the way Vogue was covering it and understand that in the context of... Uh, uh, For me it was. Was that quite an art? Oh, absolutely. Mm, I used it as a sort of guide. I used the archive as a guide and then just looked around for everything else. But there was definitely when, after the war, much more interview type... Mm at yep. home or in the in their, in their fashion home, house yeah. and a lot of commentary but i think vogue has always wanted to you know and and still today even you know it's the vogue authority it's the vogue yes, line mm-hmm. as opposed mm-hmm. to the sort of giving the story over to the person who it's about it's a point of view which mm-hmm. i think is mm-hmm. what it has always tried to reinforce mm-hmm. whereas i had maybe three or four profiles mm-hmm. of the designer as a man that was my the main, the main message I was getting Did from you, the was archive. Was there a lot of writing about the clothes themselves? There wouldn't have been. I not particularly. Not a commentary on the clothes, mm. although the, the 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 change of direction is something that would have necessi- necessitated the article. So the move to Givenchy, or the move, you know, or the setting up with the Gucci Group, all of that. Um, but actually within that it is a mini biography really more Be- than a fashion well, commentary probably because he was so close to Vogue I mean that's I guess, another yeah. privileged position like certainly this journalist who's, whose name has come up Bettina Ballard mm. uh-huh. you know she was incredibly close and Chanel really relied on her point of view Not you you had to read between the lines to dis- to discover that but certainly Vogue had the word on Chanel because yeah. I mean on McQueen because yeah. the journalist's were so close to him, so you get an incredibly uh, detailed portrait. And certainly from what I've read in American Mm. publications about McQueen, I mean, Vogue was definitely more on the money. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I think that he had links with other magazines, actually, that were were much closer. Well, like Dazed. Right, but I mean, you know, face. yeah. Mm. I think. I mean, I was working days, at the face back then. But you know, yeah. but uh, you know, certainly, yeah, mm. absolutely. Um, and in terms of collaboration and and, and personality, I think it was closer I mean, then. Mm. But I think it was. I think yeah. his the relationship and his coverage in Vogue was naturally very important. And you see some really good images mm. I love and really good articles. The, the mm. guest really edited, um, mm. when McQueen mm. guest edited Vogue, mm. yeah. that was a oh, really I've interesting. Mm. Uh, he did a photo shoot mm. with Mark Strong and mm. Charlotte Rampling, mm. which I think is in your book. Too. It is. Yeah, mm. which I think is an interesting direction that magazines can take now with yeah. um, designers. But they, yeah, they, they, touch don't, the way um, they don't com- they don't comment in the same way. That's what's interesting. Mm. There's mm. not that Vogue isn't a fashion bible in the sense of being a a comment. When does that so change? Anymore? That point where it, it does I stop wonder. being about kind of as you as the kind of content that you guys would have been finding in the archives about Scaparelli or about Chanel mm. or about Dior. Yeah. I think would be very different to the type of. I had none There's of not that. that yeah. Mm. When, Sorry, what, what are you asking? I was saying if, if you look at kind of the content that you guys would be finding from the archive, it was much more focused on the clothes, much more focused on the show look. reports. Yeah, yes, show reports, yeah. exactly. And I guess a lot of that is, the, is the, the arrival of the internet and the way in which we report fashion changing. But I was wondering if you think there's a point in which it stops yes, being about the 60s. A mag- why, why do you think? In the 60s, the 60s because in the 60s, the, the brilliance of Beatrix Miller. Um, fashion was still obviously important. I mean, they were absolutely massively out of touch with what was happening in British fashion. Mm. It, was, it was all Paris, there Paris, wasn't Paris. Anything there, yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> that's absolutely untrue. Okay, okay sorry. Uh, completely and <laughs> utterly untrue. Mary Quant, okay, okay. Clark, well, you know, right. you know. Um, but it, it became much more social then. It, yeah. it, it was more. It was much more social, and they wouldn't have dreamt. 
if they said go and wear this, it would be tongue in cheek. You know, this is at Bieber, but it was much more about the art, much more about the personalities, the fantastic mm. music, mm. filmmakers, etc. And it becomes a really fantastic a cultural, world. yeah, yeah. cultural mm. magazine. Yeah. Um, is that a sign of the times, though, or a sign of the magazine? Because you know, I think it's a bit of both, actually. Well, it, yes, possibly, but it was still exciting in the fifties. Yeah, I just think there's always like a culture of reporting at, at a different time in history. Mm. But where would people very go now to read just about the clothes and the way that they could have done in Vogue? Online. 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 Women's yeah. Wear Daily. Mm. Show reports. Vogue.co. Yeah. Mm. I'd yeah. say Women's Wear Daily, mm -hmm. actually. Mm. Yeah. And online show reports. But the show, you know. The, sorry, They're the really internet. one of the honest yes. ones. Yes, they because are. you rarely, actually, yes. unfortunately, online today read an honest review. It's true. Because everyone, everything is so connected. Mm. And, you know, it's actually incredibly frustrating. You just read these. You never hear about, like back in the day when you'd hear like, oh, they really blew it or you yeah. know, something <laughs> yeah. funny. Yeah. And, and really, women's wear is the only one that has the guts to yeah, do it. I agree. Sarah Moe on Sarah Mo Mo Starter Comp when she was writing Starter Comp, right. I think. Yeah, no, because definitely people really has. listened. And she, she doesn't do it anymore. Yeah, no, but she definitely never. And also, like, a lot of those writers want to get their seats, you know? Yes. So they don't want to, yeah. unlike Kathy Horan, who will yes, okay. say the truth. Yeah, fantastic. But not get invited Horan. back. I, I mean, wonder how that'll change, world. though, with, I mean, certainly um, it's pertinent being here because Show Studio streamed, did a live stream of mm. McQueen's last show. I mean, is that what's going to start happening? Are these shows going to have no front row? Mm -hmm. Are they all going to be on the internet? You never mm. know. And then, but I then think there's a whole I think possibility. Clothes, I mean, the, the, the importance of the front row itself is interesting, isn't it? Because mm. I think with all of our books, it's shown how the women who wear the clothes are, are equally yeah. mm -hmm. as important as the clothes themselves. So it's yeah. all about creating this culture, this world, this idea of certainly in Dior's case a lot of money and a beautiful lifestyle mm -hmm. where it's just balls and cocktails and just a kind of fabulous glamorous time. So I think that that translates in, in, in whatever small way to the front row today which is so important to be photographed and what they're wearing and then it sort of ekes out onto the pavement outside, the style bloggers and... Uh, mm. sort of yes, I agree. Yeah. I think what's different today, if there is a difference, is because a lot of these people want to be famous. And if they're not famous, you know, they want, mm. they want the mm. attention. Whereas a lot of those women were less interested, they wanted to be beautifully dressed. Mm. Mm. And it was quite private, mm. you know. And uh, yes, if they did appear in Vogue, it would be a drawing. So-and-so wore this at the, the mm. Ritz last, you know. Whereas now, and it's the, fr the front row is a very interesting phenomenon, mm. but don't isn't you th it? But don't you mm. think yes. Dior, really, yeah. Dior's yeah. new look, that really made the fashion show, I mean, certainly what I've picked up, an event. Yeah. I mean, and yes. it really did yeah. change. And Chanel felt compelled yeah. that she had to create this show when she staged her comeback show yeah. and enlisted Marie Helena Rothschild mm. to make sure she had the right models. And then mm. all the all the buyers and editors turned up, and it was actually a flop. Yeah. But the mm. only thing that saved it were those safe outfits that buyers ended yeah. up. Yeah, I think it became about more than the clothes, you're right. It became obviously about the Dior again, Dior and mm. new look. But then after that, uh, they, I think someone said that the Dior um, salon became as famous a landmark in mm. Paris as the Eiffel Tower. People used mm -hmm. to come over uh, from everywhere. I think um, uh, an actress, I can't remember, said that it was, you just heard Chicago accents in the showroom, just nothing oh. but American accents. So I think they showed the collections twice a day and it was absolutely yeah. packed out. So mm. it did become this phenomenon that was hype, which mm. was it connected to the clothes or was it connected to Dior and the hype? I think both things were happening. Mm. But it's kind of a pity today yeah. that the houses aren't as front and center as they mm. used to be because certainly Scaparelli mm. had immense style. Mm. Her atelier was Jean-Michel Franck or something, wasn't it? Or uh, he did, yes, he did. Sorry, you know, yes, and then yes. Chanel's house, a Rue Cambon, mm. certainly a mm. landmark. But then you get to McQueen and he was like Hoxton Square. Yeah, and today you'll never hear yeah. about, they like, did. say, yeah. how, no. how BB Philo has created the Celine house. You know, it was yes. always a permanent part of the mm. identity of a designer. And now it seems a bit lost mm. unfortunately yes mm. I wonder why that is I think because actually there is this 
I think designers today, don't you think, want to be more private? They're kind of over the yeah, kind of... they're so exposed. Yeah. I wanted yeah, to ask privacy. Like, I think it's very easy. It's quite a kind of trotted out myth and we'd say everything is so much more about celebrity now. And I think people quite naturally presume that designers now have to spend more time kind of on this celebrity wheel and, and become more famous. But actually, that was really interesting about what both of you were and in the Dior book as well was how much these women, they embodied their own brand and they were mm. almost as as much of a celebrity as the women they were dressing. Mm. And why do you think that has like, that has disintegrated? Well, Ch Chanel never wanted, I mean, well, no, I don't think Still it has. I mean, if you, or Phoebe Philo, yeah. she really is the center, but she never wanted, that's why she never really went into Hollywood and made, you know, huge mark there because mm. she never wanted anyone upstaging her own identity yeah. <laughs> or never put models in her perfume ads until, you know, the very end. But she, it was all about her. Mm. Could you, you couldn't make a brand like that today though. It's I don't see why not. I mean, I think that, I think that say Balmain, the designer at Balmain, mm -hmm. he's not really that known. I mean, he is a little bit, but there are a lot of, I think, I think Tom it, there's- Ford did it. Oh yes, yes, yes. Oh yeah, no, but I you're mean, saying- I think designers can, can embody their own brand still mm -hmm. and do and, and build a success on the back of it. Mm. But I do think it's interesting because oh, we're, yeah. we're all talking about, we're all talking about- Men, interestingly, not women. Chloe. Uh, talking about brands that are all, you know, uh, well, Pop Wall Scaparelli's about to start going mm. again. But they're, you know, you've discussed this before, but they're all old brands. They're mm. heritage brands. Well, is that what the new movie is? <laughs> no, yeah, sometimes, yeah, Chanel, well, you know, but they, they've got, you know, heritage and all of this kind of stuff. And it must be very, very difficult going in as a new designer to that. But, um, so, but there just seems to be a lot of kudos in that and building on, on heritage. And I think, therefore, it would be more difficult being a young designer and starting really on your own. But was that McQueen's success is because he found his heritage in other places? It wasn't from going in, I know obviously at Givenchy, but with his own label, he didn't go and have an archive from a house he was moving into. He found that archive, whether it was his time at Anderson Shepherd or whether, when he was at Angels doing those mm. incredible No, it was after his head. I think, I agree. Think, but he didn't his, yes. his, his clothes were grounded in history. I mean, yes, they were grounded in nature as well. Mm. Yes, more in nature, mm. but but both, both. But I think all designers, there's an inevitable kind of backlog for all of them, isn't there, of 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 fashion history that just is intrinsic mm. in them, mm. and it forms part of their DNA, and then they project forward from that. Mm. We've talked a little bit about new reporting styles, and that has been mentioned this with with the internet, which we've talked about. But do you worry that we're going to kind of lose that? sense of history because I don't think that's something that's picked up on I that don't. much in the way that fashion's reported now it's a lot focused on imagery whether it's like mm. Instagrams or pictures yeah, I, or live I, show imagery mm. history is a hard sell as a fashion historian <laughs> but, but, and, I, and I see you know designers being championed as the next big thing when they're copying things that were like mm. five years old almost mm. there's yes, no sense yes. of perspective today but I mean yeah yes I don't mean to sound middle no, aged no but, but um, there's nothing wrong with being middle aged <laughs> <laughs> the, thing, the thing is, um, I think that writers should know about the history and they should, uh, they yeah. should understand it. That, you know, it doesn't matter whether the fashion history is sexy or not. What is sexy is knowing your subject mm -hmm. and understanding it and knowing if somebody's got something on the runway that they've lifted from John Paul Gaultier 10 years before, you damn well should know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's not getting his due. Do you, you know, <laughs> etc. You know, and I think, I mean, that's just being professional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That really is. What I is. think is interesting is American Vogue have put their entire archive online. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. Oh. Um, and I think that's going to be a way that people, young students today and, and anyone just who has an interest in fashion history are going to be able to access these things. I wonder if British Vogue will do the same, I, I don't know. But, but is um, that a role that books can can play? Do we kind yeah. of, it's kind of paradoxical, but we almost need that to counterbalance what we're seeing online, which is this fast reportage, but we also need the kind of the meat that we all talked about that you all found from that Vogue archive, mm. and that's a... Do you books are crucial. Mm. Books are crucial, but they're, like they're inc it's incredibly difficult with books. I mean, it's really hard selling books. People don't realize it, and you have to push them on people almost. I mean, because people would rather watch, mm. and you know, yeah. I, I, I'd actually like to see smarter commentary on TV about fashion. I think mm. that is. Un, an underdeveloped area, and even on radio. I mean, mm. it's just so fascinating. Mm. If you go, there's been a real rise in talks about fashion, mm. and 
people flock to them. Mm, and yes. you know, Radio 4, turn on Radio 4, do you hear fashion? It is a struggle to get fashion. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because the producers think, oh, well, you can't really see it, but you can describe it, and it can mm. be even more beautiful. Yes, exactly. Do you think it's to do with, with fashion becoming more unaffordable maybe than it once was. Well, Real think, fashion. I mean, fashion is a spectator sport. You don't have to yeah. afford it. You can go to Primark, you can go to Uniqlo and buy a little bit of it. You don't mm. have to own the thing. Very mm. few people do. And I'm actually happier that there is more of a divide today between the luxury brands and the high street because it used to be 10 years back that everyone thought that they could afford Prada. Well, it's absolute nonsense mm. actually. Mm. And But they are showing us, it's, it's just, I mean, it's aesthetically gratifying, I think, to look at fashion kind of and fashion. To, to look at, at an interesting, fa interestingly staged fashion show. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I would just like to see kind of more intelligent discourse out there, not necessarily just books. Mm -hmm. Is that what you were all hoping with this series then, was to kind of, yeah, create that intelligent discourse, to create something where, whether it's a student or whether it's, as you said, someone who's just interested in fashion can mm -hmm. go and get some, some knowledge outside of whether it's reported on McQueen's death or whether it's watching Coco before Chanel, they can actually go and, and understand a designer's life and, the, and their development rather than just sort of... But also through the Vogue prism, I think. That's, yes. that's what the Vogue authority. Mm -hmm. This is something, you know, that we've done the work, we've gone through the archive and this is how it was presented and this is what was particularly fascinating about the way that Vogue was there as a kind of standard bearer for these designers. So mm -hmm. I think that particularly I found fascinating and yeah. hopefully people will find it fascinating too that it has this imprimatur, this vogue imprimatur that, that mm. this is the way that it's being it's presented. It's almost two that. moments in history, it's not just the designer's life, it's also the way it was captured by. Yeah, and yeah. Who, who was writing and who was ph photographing and what was, what was going on, what was the kind of cultural soup <laughs> they were floating mm. in, you know. Yeah, that's always part yeah. of Vogue. Yeah. yeah, I think that books are important because uh, I think books are important because they they last, mm. and what's yeah. on the internet, ninety percent of it. Uh, you, you know, if you read a biography of, of Chanel, it's utter rubbish on the internet. Mm. You know, same with McQueen. Mm. Don't even know what year he left college. Mm. You know, you see it again and again mm. and again. Dior and of course all the, you know. So yeah. actually, yes, doing something with some kind of authority, I think, is really important. It isn't just about whether they were fantastic personalities, but it is, it is providing information, mm -hmm. uh, and visually good information, I think, that's, that's really important. Because there are, all, you know, there are people being born all the time. And, you know, some of them are going to want to work in fashion, some of them are going to want to be artists, some of them are going to want to be writers. You know, if they can find this in a library or any books in a library, I, I, you know, they, it, it's crucial and they last. Yeah. Magazines don't last. They don't unless they're preserved. They don't. They go in the bin. Mm -hmm. You know, they just a, a book is something which I think is important. But the same token, I completely agree with Bronwyn about television and um, because of its power. Media. Yeah, but you know, every, no, but I mean, I'm a big book person. So bad, yes, you know, I know. Really, it's yeah, just no, fashion. Room. Oh God, do me a favour. It's ghastly <laughs> yeah. people showing off. God, they're so vain. Oh, they're so pretentious. Well, actually. Mm -hmm. Clothes and fashion reflect who we are, mm. you know, and where we are as a society. Also, all of these writers, it, it wasn't about, for them, it wasn't about fashion. That's what's interesting. Mm. It, mm. It's, fashion is the medium in which they work, all of them. But they're, they're artists in their own right. Mm. Mm. Yeah, they're complex. Complex. They're really, yeah. yeah. They're that word, that word of personality is yes. very interesting, and they're commissioning four more books and four after that. And the really fascinating common denominator is that these people were incredible personalities, mm -hmm. and the and the work is not secondary; it's as important. But isn't that the interesting? But in a way, the thing? medium is, sec is secondary. It's fashion is the sphere they're working in, but it's as yeah. you said, mm -hmm. it's more than that. It's not just yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to put my hands up. It's their work. Mm. It's their yeah. work. That's uh, their lives. Yes, whatever. It's their work. Mm. It is their work. And seeing it in this, and in this, and this, and in this, is really, really important. Because if we are actually talking about 
designers who are at St Martin's or wherever today, they are going to look at that yeah. because yeah. they won't have seen. They won't. Have, they certainly won't have seen this. Yeah. No stuff in this. Or, you know, or Chanel. Certainly not Scaparelli either. Well, all together in one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it will be, you know, a revelation. Mm, Actually, yeah. I'm sorry to teach mm. them. It will be a revelation. But I mean, I, to be honest with yeah. you, you know, like I bought that Diana Vreeland mm. DVD. I went to see that film, um, The Eye Has to Travel, twice in one week. I was so captivated mm. by it. And I don't know if I would, and, and I bought the DVD like I would buy a book. So I do think that there is room, like moving images, it's just what we're doing today, right? Mm -hmm. There is yes. this incredible, I think there needs to be a balance of both, mm -hmm. but I would like to see more fashion. Fashion has sort of become slightly corralled into documentary territory, which I think is yes. fantastic. You know, you mm. have the September issue, you mm. have the, kind of the world of fashion, and then you, you have, I think Valentino has a documentary mm. as well. And so I think there is definitely a, an appetite for that, for a visual kind of understanding of a, of a fashion brand or, or in the case of American Vogue and how it works. But I think books, I'm, I'm pro books. I'm on the yeah. side of books. I have a Kindle, but I do think that if I want, if I'm looking for information and I want source material, I'll always go to books. Yeah, mm. definitely. And I just think they're just so lovely and covetable as well. That's a nice <laughs> note to end our book club on. Books are lovely and covetable. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you all so much. We give ourselves a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.